controversial flag project valued at 22 million rand has ignited a conversation about challenges of social cohesion in a post-democratic South Africa. Three decades later, the reality is that millions of South Africans are yet to taste and enjoy the so-called democratic gains. The gap between the rich and the poor keeps widening. It's a total opposite of what the late president, uh, former president, rather Nelson Kholikha Mandela, envisioned in 1994. That is a rainbow nation. Dreams and aspirations promised then remain stillborn. Let's take a listen quickly uh, just to remind us of this vision as espoused by the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Mpilo Tutu on Mandela Day way back in 2013. He makes us walk tall as, as South Africans and reminds us that we have the capacity to be this fantastic nation. Uh, yes, even if there are those who, who pour scorn on, on the image, the, 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 the rainbow people saying we, 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 we delight, we glory in our diversity, uh, our diversity which makes us such a fantastic uh, bunch of people. And, yeah, there are ugly things that happen. Uh, we, we will get there. We will get there. The late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu being very hopeful and optimistic that one day the rainbow people will get there despite the challenges. Now, let's bring into this conversation this afternoon on today here on ENCA, DSTV Channel 43, Dr. Ibrahim Harvey, an independent political analyst and writer, a political commentator Jamie Mighty, along with Ernst van Zeyl, who speaks on behalf of, uh, of Afri Forum. And uh, Mr. van Zeyl is joining us virtually, but uh, the other two gentlemen are with me in the studio. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for your time. I'm just going to start with an overriding question first. Having listened to that clip that was expressed uh, in 2013, not so long ago, but just under a decade ago, nine years ago, by the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Mbilo Tutu. Will we get there? Let me start with you, Mr. Mighty. Well, I think we're not on track to get there. And fundamentally, some of the signs that we're seeing are the incidents that are occurring in the schools. We are seeing, you know, um, black students feeling victimized, ostracized, and discriminated against in the schools, but also what we saw at the University of Stellenbosch um, just last week in terms of integration at a university level in the spaces where students have to come together to try to manifest this rainbow. I think that we're not seeing traction. We're also not seeing buy-in from young people. Mr. Fanze, will we get there? Really, uh, the thing, uh, the question about how, whether we will get there or not will depend on whether the government is willing to give up its uh, racially discriminatory laws and its uh, racial categorizing that it just copy and pasted from the pre previous apartheid regime. And uh, Dr. Harvey, will we get there? You see, the, the question is get where? You see, you need to ask that question, including what uh, the Archbishop uh, did, you know, uh, with all due respect. All the talk of nation building and you know, uh, this that uh, the Archbishop was talking about, Rainbow Nation, is, is pie in the sky stuff. It's up there, nationhood and so on. We're sitting with the biggest unemployment, social just injustices, poverty ever in the history, Dan, of South Africa. Forget about just post apart. I'm talking ever in the, right now. So if you talk about getting there and you're talking just broadly and vaguely without the question of social justice, water, sanitation, electricity, housing, jobs, those are the things that people, that is the heart of the crisis in the country. I think That's my part, concern. Yeah, I think part of getting there, our, the forefathers or founding fathers of this constitution included social justice, quite correctly, included inclusion, uh, Mr. Mighty, quite correctly, and that's where Mr. Fanzel is saying you've, there are certain communities in South Africa, uh, like many members of Afro Forum that you represent, who feel excluded Included, therefore you want to change in the laws but is it only up to government to make sure that we live peacefully together as a nation together mr mighty or up to each the agency also sits with each and every south african citizen 
I think the agency does sit with each and every one of us, but in different ways. And I think the comments that we got actually from the Afroforum representative are reflective of that. Because he says, listen, affirmative action policies are discriminatory in the way that the apartheid regime was. So he's implying that BEE and other policies are bad policies in principle. And actually that speaks to challenging the idea of social justice, challenging trying to fix um, the wrongs of apartheid. Because if we think about why did we actually choose these, these policies of affirmative action in BE, it was to redress the exclusion of people on the basis of the race. So you can't say that the redress is, is equivalent morally to the, to the offense at the onset. Mr. Fazel, why are you equating affirmative action BE, the redress of past imbalances, to apartheid? Well, firstly, uh, what was copy and pasted, what I said, was the racial categorization of uh, whites and black. You take all the South Africa as a country of Zulus, Chongas, uh, Vendas, Afrikaners, and then you just put them into these racial categories that the apartheid regime created of white and black. And then uh, that's the thing that I was saying was copy and pasted. The ANC uh, thought, it seems, thought that was a very good idea uh, from the previous regime. To answer the question of uh, equating uh, uh, what's happening today with the past, it's rather a question of principle, and uh, Mr. Jamie uh, touched on that. Can we not agree that racial discrimination and racially discriminatory laws are wrong in principle? I, I mean, the, the, the theme of this conversation is about social cohesion. Now, racial discrimination destroys social cohesion in every arena, in sport, in the workplace. It others people. It puts people what, into what, boxes. What is it? it puts what is it? Yeah, into racial yeah. categories Mr. Say, or by yeah. the previous regime. What is it about the categorization of people into? racial groups to address the past because if you remember apartheid used job reservation as well to promote jobs for white south africans particularly africana white south africans that's the past we've had but what is it about it that in you is is wrong in terms of saying let's try and redress this balance and say how many black people would we need in certain positions and let's affirm them in that position what's wrong with that what's the principle for you that is it wrong is it is wrong because you are stereotyping an entire race rather than looking at it at a case-by-case -case basis. Is this the son of a rich carder or is this the son of a person that grew up in a shack in the township? That's a very big difference. And under uh, these blanket laws of white and black and uh, uh, basing laws on these racial categories that were thought up by the previous regime, you are giving, uh, you are giving assistance to people that, uh, are, that don't need it while rejecting others that do need it rather than going on a case-by-case -case basis. Like I said, when you're taking a blanket statement or a blanket categorization and stereotype of an entire race, then you are pretty much giving, uh, uh, you are trying to solve problems that aren't there sometimes. For example, the, the son of a rich politician, if they are black, will get, uh, uh, will get benefits from uh, racially discriminatory laws, while the son of a, a poor, unemployed white South African that grew up uh, in a house that was uh, unemployed and poor uh, will then be discriminated against. That's the problem because that's the problem that inevitably uh, results when we can't agree that racial let, stereotyping let me, and racial yeah. uh, discrimination is wrong in principle. Dr. Harvey, let me bring you in here. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Dan. You see, let me tell you quite honestly, I've written at length about both BE and AA as mainly benefited the elite and black middle class. It's very clear. Stephen Friedman has spoken about it at length, many people. So I hear this. I think there's issues that he raises that is correct. There is a lot of racialization in our laws, you know. Uh, but, I mean, I think it's a different matter. When you start talking of social cohesion, you have to address social justice. It's like you could not have reconciliation without social justice. You cannot have social cohesion without social justice. Dan, what is going on in the black townships? It's falling apart. It's the lack of social justice. Water, sanitation, electricity. It's in the, in the uh, Bill of Rights, in the Constitution, yet people do not enjoy it. Where, 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 where does social justice stack up for you, uh, Mr. Mighty, in terms of uh, when we are hearing this? I mean, you are hearing the explanation by, by Mr. Van Zale saying this is why he thinks the principle of categorizing according to race is principally wrong, because you could end up even discriminating against uh, somebody who deserves to get a chance. 
Well, first and foremost, I don't think that you can make policy on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to look at the general trends, which is why you have office like Stats SA. And I think we need to be cautious when we talk about social redress, because we are talking about social justice. And the social justice that has, the ANC hasn't done a great job, but the ongoing social justice is exactly what is creating the lack of cohesion. Because on one side, people are saying, you're discriminating against us, because we used to enjoy this thing exclusively. And now you're bringing in other people into the room. There are no incentives for boardrooms to diversify. There are no incentives for private schools to diversify. There are no incentives for uh, affluent neighborhoods to diversify, which is why you have to use policy to create those kind of mandates, right? But it's not discrimination to do so. When we build a wheelchair ramp in the building, we're not discriminating against the able-bodied. We're creating an equitable and accessible workplace. And we need to be very cautious when people push back towards some of these social pro programs by arguing that they are exceptions to the rule. We know that they are exceptions to the rule. We know that they are rich children who go to St. John's who are black. But in the main, there is still a necessity for people to be given access to universities, to different boardrooms and opportunities that we, they wouldn't get otherwise. What, what, what's your view about the criticism of BE, for example, that it's benefited a few elite black, uh, black elite, as an example, and, and we've seen the deepening of poverty in the same time in the yes, country. Yes. There's a policy that... Yes, of course. Well, what's your view on that? I think that that would be a criticism of the practitioner. They can be of the a, implementation. Yes, they can be a bad doctor, but that doesn't necessarily mean that medicine in and of itself is bad. I think that the ANC execution hasn't been excellent, but I think the principle of saying that we need to remove the knife that was put into the back of black people, of colored people, by apartheid policies to address the structural injustices which continue. I don't think that's fundamentally wrong, and I don't think that it's fair or correct to say it's discrimination. I think it's part of the problem when you characterize it like that and talk to your 300,000 members or however many Afroforum represents and say, let's oppose this, let's oppose land reform, let's oppose all of these policies as part of saying it's discrimination. Yeah, and many people would argue that land is also a big, big issue in terms of social cohesion. Dr. Harvey, you wanted to say no, something. No, I'll come no. to you now, Mr. Fanzel. No, Dan, are you aware that BE and AA, and much has been written, it's full up in the literature, because it has tended to benefit a few of the elite and more numerous black middle class, it has actually deepened social inequalities in post party South Africa. It's because how it so, was implemented? No, so that what you have now, Dan, interracial between black and white is dwarfed now. The biggest grow, growth of social inequality is interracial. So do you know the massive gulf between the black elite, the Ramaposas, the Mutsepias, and the black people in the townships? It has never been as big as it is now. This is what, you know, one of the unintended consequences of A and B. It has a okay. massive gulf exists. It never existed before. And the result of B E and A A because it does not the biggest beneficiaries is not your black majority working class then. It's not meant for them, as Stephen Friedman said to me, Brian, so, please, so, come on. Yeah, so not... we have a problem that uh, in the classification, I'll, I'll use that term very broadly, gentlemen, uh, uh, we, we've seen these gaps having, the policy was, was the right policy, ANC, you said, was not really good enough in the execution, implementation, the benefits are lopsided, the gaps are big. But there are other things that bother me when we talk about social cohesion, okay? This is just one aspect. A, a young man goes to the residence of another young man and urinates on his desk simply because it's of a different color. I mean, that's, that's shocking. You can look at it anyhow. I mean, people, we know about bullying in school. We know about all those things. I mean, what kind of a home would bring up such a young man, Mr. Fanzay? What do you think? Firstly, I want to uh, just use the opportunity to respond to what has been said because I think it's very important seeing as there was some criticism and support of what I said. Uh, firstly, uh, completely correct what uh, my fellow panelists just mentioned is the fact that in, inter within the racial group, uh, inequality has increased uh, to a point that it uh, is uh, un historically has never before seen. And that's the thing. And I want to, because uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jamie said that uh, racial discrimination uh, is not Mike, in principle Jamie, wrong. Jamie it only Mike, depends yeah. on the target. Sorry. And I just wanted yeah. to say, 
Yes, I just wanted to quickly say, call me controversial, but I think racially discriminatory laws in principle are wrong. And that is why we are getting uh, a lot of these unintended consequences, as we saw earlier. When it comes to uh, what happened in Stellenbosch, I mean, firstly, uh, we have to see what the, uh, the investigation uh, result is uh, at the university. But secondly, I saw an interview this week of the victim uh, saying that there was nothing said to him that indicates that it was a, a racially motivated uh, crime that was committed. But at the same time, uh, what that student did was abhorrent. It is uh, criminal in my, in my view, and the, whatever happens uh, regarding the charges laid against him, the law needs to take its course. Okay, where does social cohesion then begin? I mean, I hear your response there. Some mm. people have taken it and said, this is a racial incident. You said the, pe the young man uh, whom, uh, uh, who, who was the, the, the victim in this case uh, feels mm. like that. But the rest of the student body there are saying it's not. It's racially motivated. The president earlier praising the students of Stellenbosch for standing up. He says it reminds him of 1976 student activists who stand up for, for discrimination and, and, and sorts. But social Social cohesion, this expression has been, has been used for mm. a long time in our country. When we have Heritage Day, September, we talk about social cohesion. Now the flag thing was there, we talk about social cohesion. Where are we failing? Let's just, just a little bit, I just want to hear your view. I mean, you know the mm. social justice issues. We know there's inequality, there's poverty. We know there's a lack of uh, uh, or bad implementation of good policy. Mm. But social cohesion, where, where are we failing, Dr. Harvey? Can I begin with you? No, let me tell you where we're failing <laughs> to begin with. And nobody has, you can go through the literature. Everybody, it's a cliched expression now, social cohesion, but no, it begs the definition. Nobody has adequately defined what social cohesion is. Social justice has been defined. But there's no doubt because people live, they live by the conditions that they inhabit, water, sanitary, etc. Social justice then, if you do not pursue social justice, social cohesion is a mirage. You'll never ever experience it and or realize it. Besides so having to clarify it in definition. The is social justice. Mr. Fanzai? Hmm. Uh, Dan, I'll tell you exactly where, where we failed when it comes to social cohesion. Where we failed is that firstly, we have a government that has miserably failed in regards to lifting millions out of poverty in this country, a government that would rather spend 350 million to give gifts and donations to their friends in Cuba, a government that would rather spend billions as, it been, as it's been revealed on extravagant dinners and salaries, and rather 22 million on a flag. And then when they are challenged on this wasteful and cor uh, sp expenditure and on corruption, they laugh about it. That what, that's what we saw this week when uh, uh, Sir Ramaphosa, the president, addressed the Black Business Council. He was talking about that 22 million that was going to be wasted on a flag and he laughed about it. And at the same, in the same week where millions of South Africans are suffering because of flooding, where millions of South Africans are suffering because they can't afford food because uh, the prices are going up, petrol prices are out of control, uh, unemployment is at levels never before seen, that is the real problem. But we, the problem when it comes to social cohesion is the fact that the politicians and the politically connected elite in this country want to make it, a, make it seem as if race relations are horrible and want to make it seem as if racism is the biggest problem in this country when it is not. But they want to do that. You want to know why? They want to do that because of the mass, masses of this country that are, are impoverished and unemployed. Don't blame white people. They will start looking at those that have, exp uh, that have exploited them uh, and that have been corrupt at their expense. And those people will then know what will be done to them. That is the problem. That's why social cohesion problems are arising in South Africa because the politically connected elite and politicians of this country want to make racism uh, the biggest problem and want to make as if race relations are horrible. That is not true. If you talk to any person on the street, if you talk to regular South Africans, they will tell you their biggest issues are unemployment, their biggest issues are getting education for their children, and their biggest issues is putting food on the table. Okay. That is the big problem, and Mr. we uh, can't solve that if we focus on problems that are not the primary issue. Yeah, I, 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 have a, I have a different view in terms of racism is not a problem because it's still a problem. But it might not no, be I didn't as big. Say it's not it a might, problem. I said yeah. it is not the biggest problem. Just to yeah, be clear. It is, okay, fine. I take your point. But anyway, Mr. Mighty, your your view. Three reasons why we're not having social cohesion. Number one, to have it, you need to have good faith intent on all of the parties. And some of the parties are participating in the conversations around social cohesion in bad faith. And 
that also requires meaningful reconciliation. Meaning re reconciliation means that you have to be willing and actually take part in the activities of sharing space, resources, and opportunities. And that sometimes speaks to policy. You have to be willing to share land, your workspaces, and access to opportunities. And also, meaningful reconciliation requires that you have proper narratives. When you have people saying that if you ask me to share, you're discriminating against me from something that I've been benefiting the whole time. If I'm the only person drinking water at the tap in a river, and then uh, in a village, and then you come and say, let other people drink, and then I say, why are you discriminating against me? I've always been drinking this water. Surely I've always you been can... drinking this water alone. <laughs> yes. Now you're bringing other people. Yes, and now you're discriminating against me. We're not discriminating against you by saying share spaces, share resources and opportunities. It's, it's it's, it's uh, you know, the spirit of the constitution of South Africa in terms of, of this rainbow people that Archbishop Tutu spoke about and us as a di beautifully diverse country is captured in the fact that South Africa belongs to all those who live in it, black and white. It's there in the constitution opening in the, in the preamble, but many people would feel that it does not belong to them. Mm. The majority of people, if you are jobless, if you're a young South African, mm, nice. you can't see any hope. Dr. Harvey, how do you feel? Yes, absolutely. But then here's a bigger question. The ANC needs to ask this question. What is, do you know that... Sorry, needs to ask which question? This, answer this question. Poverty, unemployment and social inequalities are far worse today than they were during the apartheid years. How can that be possible? This is what's happened. No one doubts it. I mean, uh, Cyril, often the president speaks about it. Everyone speaks about it. How did it happen in post-apartheid South Africa? That greater poverty, inequalities, and unemployment is our lot today compared to during the apartheid times. I mean, it's incredible. This is what is, has yeah, happened. Because the, the, the word rainbow, in my mind, when I, I mean, you saw we've got this, this thing about we're focused on social cohesion under the ban of Rainbow Nation. Hence, I played the clip, one of the clips of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu and said, we're still going there. We're going to reach it one day. The word rainbow rainbow conjures up images of beauty, images of hope, you know, you know that uh, old saying, uh, whether it's true or not, there's a pot of gold yeah. at the end of rainbow, but yeah. nobody feels like that, the majority of people in, in South Africa. So how do we move, okay? Let, I just want to take the conversation because we're going to be concluding shortly. Mr. Fanzei, how do we move together in an inclusive way where we recognize that the past has to be redressed? properly and everybody feels included and we've got those shared spaces including land how do we do that in a way that will make this a prosperous i know dr harvey is going to look at me funny rainbow nation <laughs> mm. how do we do it all right no, it's it's yes no dan i think that's so uh, that's a good question now firstly what i would say is important is that we need mutual respect between groups we cannot have one group stereotyping another and then saying but it's fine when that group does it but it's not fine when another group does it and we need to be able to agree that certain things are not correct and not right in principle some things are wrong in principle discriminating against the entire racial group through laws is wrong morally wrong uh, stereotyping an entire racial group is wrong, no matter who does it. Racism towards an uh, 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 entire racial group, no matter who it comes from, is wrong. Every race can be racist, black, white, Indian, everyone. It's possible for them to be racist. We cannot have double standards. That's the first thing. Next, what needs to happen is that we need to call out politicians when they are shifting the goalposts when they are trying to distract people away from the actual problems. The real problems, as I said earlier in, the, in this country, the real pressing problems that the average man in the street feels in his wallet, in his pocket, are the problems of unemployment, bad quality of education, and corruption and crime, to put uh, them all into one category. Those are the major pressing issues. Doesn't mean there aren't other problems, doesn't mean the other problems should be ignored, but those are the major problems that need to be solved. And then lastly, what needs to be done going forward is that we all need to acknowledge each other's identities. It's not wrong to, have, uh, to be proud of your Zulu identity or to be proud of your Tonga identity or to be proud of your Afrikaner identity. These are healthy, uh, healthy things to be, and these are healthy things to take into account. Uh, it shouldn't okay. be something that is granted to one group but denied to another.
Okay, Jamie, I'm going to come to you. We're ending now. I mean, it's really the end because I also, you know, you've got time pressures. Yeah. What have you got to say? How do we do it? I think what it really requires is real action. For example, in, in the Stellenbosch incident, the student did make racist comments. He said, this is what we do to black people. And what we would have liked to see, I think, to create real cohesion is all of the community groups actually coming into the university, standing in solidarity with the victims because there are issues of systemic uh, racism at the university that have been brought up by the students protesting today. So AfriForum has platform. Go to the University of Stellenbosch and speak to the students and actually stand in solidarity with them because you just said in principle we must always oppose something that's bad. If we start seeing actions like that, people will start coming together. Okay. Dr. Harvey, you, but, uh, uh, I know uh, social justice is a basic point. For yeah, but, how do you but I can put it even the other way. Yes. The greater your social justice you have, the more you're going to secure what is called social cohesion. But then what's happening in KZN now with the floods? The disproportionate effect, overwhelming majority of poor people are suffering because of that. What did the ANC do? 2019 was their last floods. They did nothing from 2019, and hence this has happened this year. And it's you been know? a double whammy in a short space of time. Yes. Just this last weekend, but it's the, parts the, of KZ. The glaring lack of social justice, where poor housing, where housing, uh, uh, low-lying areas, vulnerable. This is all the issues that are coming up in KZN. It speaks to the very issues I'm talking about. Gentlemen, I wish we had more time and there's lots to speak about. That the only thing I'm going to say that is important to keep talking, and you're quite right, Dr. Mighty. I mean, organizations, whoever you are, you can be seen in action to be visible in standing for the right thing. I think that's important, and social justice there. And, of course, mutual respect across the board is another point that's been made there by Mr. Fanzel. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim Avi, independent political analyst and writer, political commentator Jamie Might, and Ernest Fanzel and, uh, and, uh, from AfriForum. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Jamie Might is an independent political commentator.